So today I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this topic that I'm calling representation technologies. And so what do I mean by that? And so I'm going to start with uh, my problem statement in, in one slide. And my problem statement is that my clicker doesn't work. My problem statement in one slide. So this is a chart that's developed by Mark Graham and his group at Oxford Internet Institute. And this shows the distribution of user-generated content that's indexed by Google. And you can just see that it's dominated by a few countries, most notably the United States, a little bit in Western Europe. But you can see large countries with huge populations like China and India still relatively underrepresented on the internet. And this isn't even talking about disparities within countries, which are in some cases even more stark, where we're seeing that the internet as a phenomenon is still only reaching a small percentage of the population, in particular in terms of authoring content and creating content and representing one's own perspective. And so this leads me to the topic of my talk, representational technologies. And so if you think about information technology as a tool, it's fundamentally about representing and communicating human knowledge. But the problem is, is the internet, uh, as, as, a, as a place for doing that, still only represents a very small fraction of human knowledge in terms of the sources of that knowledge, the kinds of that knowledge, and the forms of knowledge that are represented there. And so the hypothesis for my talk, or the, or the thesis statement for my talk, is that we must design for diversity. And diversity not only in the kinds of users that we design for, but also the forms of knowledge that they hold. <clears throat> so I'm going to give a short outline for my talk. You know, first I'm going to talk about a project called Awaz Day, which thinks about new user interfaces for having, uh, un allowing underrepresented groups to, to author content for the internet or internet-like systems. Um, then I'm going to talk about local ground, which rethinks processes of data collection, data analysis, and visualization to support goals of learning and access so people can understand what data is and what kind of roles it can play uh, in society and in, in, and in other important venues. And finally, I'm going to talk about, in the context of local ground, whether these kinds of new forms of knowledge and new processes of handling data and knowledge can actually lead to more equitable political representation. And I'm going to leave that as a kind of open question because I really don't know the answer to that question quite yet. So first I'm going to start with a Waz Day. And so a Waz Day is trying to address a, a very new kind of user group for the internet. And, and the user group that I'm going to talk about is a typical small farmer in India uh, who's working uh, as a <coughs> primarily in the agriculture space. Um, and these kinds of users are, you know, so far not really engaging in internet, not really definitely not creating content for the internet in, in appreciable numbers. And so this is a system uh, that, that, uh, that we've tried to build to address some of these limitations. It's called Awaz Day. Awaz Day means give voice in Hindi. And the reason for that will become apparent in a couple of slides. <clears throat> so I'm going to build on for this talk this kind of concept of orality. And so a, a, a typical small farmer in India, if you think about how they create knowledge and how they access knowledge and how they share it amongst their communities, it's typically through word of mouth. They either hear something interesting and they act on it, or they tell their friends about something and they act on it, right? And so there's this process of word of mouth where things are exchanged through conversation and primarily through oral conversation with one's peers and, and other associates. And so Walter Ong, you know, working uh, in, in, in the early 80s, wrote a book called Orality and Literacy where he proposes that these kinds of oral communities not only communicate primarily using these kinds of means, but they also have fundamentally different ways of organizing and managing and dealing with information and knowledge. So these means are different in, 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 in several ways. So one way that they're different is that the knowledge bases these kinds of communities tend to create are aggregative. They aggregate knowledge as opposed to being reductionist where they try to create uh, very well-defined hierarchies of, of knowledge. And what that means, you know, one example of this kind of knowledge base is, is mythology. So if we think about mythology, there are many, many different stories. Some of them are, are redundant. They make the same point in different ways. Some of them may even be conflicting. They make different points, um, you know, religious mythologies being a, a great example of this. And so these knowledge tend to be aggregative as opposed to reductionist to a basic set of principles or ideas. Second, they're situ situational. They're directly tied to issues and concerns and circumstances that are important within specific contexts, right? They're not meant to be discussing abstract principles or ideas. They're very much tied to real day-to-day -day lived concerns. And finally, they're dialectic. You know, they're, these kinds of knowledge bases are built up through conversation and discussion as opposed to created uh, from scratch. And so we have lots of these kinds of uh, 
uh, knowledge bases on the internet. You know, Usenet is an example, Twitter is another example. So lots of different examples of knowledge bases that have these kinds of properties of orality uh, that have been discussed here. So the thought we had is that can we build a version of this system of an or orality inspired knowledge base for small farmers in India. And so I did this work with Neil Patel, whom I'm sure a lot of you know, or at least know of. He was a graduate student here in the HCI group, also worked with Scott Clemmer. And, and <laughs> this is primarily his work that I'm going to be talking about. We also worked very closely with a not-for-profit organization to design the system called Development Support Center. It's an NGO located in Ahmedabad and Gujarat in India, and they have a lot of expertise and knowledge in working with small farmers uh, in that region. So the system we built was very simple. It was basically a voice-based, interactive voice response system, which provided you three top-level options. One, to be able to ask a question or post a message. Two, to be able to listen to and respond to questions of other people. And three, just to hear news about, about your community. Local color, music is part of, part of it. So the kinds of questions that the system got, you know, are questions that have to do with basic concerns of farmers, you know. So for example, if they want to grow cotton, where should and how should they grow it? And some of the questions could be more technical. So once a question was recorded, it came to a moderator. A moderator was in charge of actually managing each of these questions. The moderator used an interface not unlike the kinds of interfaces you use for managing your communi asynchronous communications, like an email inbox, for example. The only difference being that is that because this was voice content, the moderator also had to add some metadata to make this content easier to refer to in the future. And so they added information about the caller, where they're from, and they also categorized the uh, question that, uh, uh, according to what topic it was considering and what crop it was related to. So based on this information, the question was assigned to one of a pool of, of potential experts. These experts were lead farmers that were known to DSC or were known to be ec have expertise in specific topics or in specific regions. And so when an expert was assigned a message, they got a call at their house or on their phone, which allowed them to answer the, listen to the, to the question, potentially answer it if they had an answer. And then finally, if they didn't have an answer or if they thought there'd be a better resource for, ha for, 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 for that question, they could forward it to another farmer in their network who might have that kind of expertise. And so in this way, the system grows its network of potential respondents in a kind of viral way. Finally, if, if once an answer was provided, that answer would be sent, again, asynchronously to the farmer, and they would be able to listen to it, and also to potentially respond to it if they needed some clarifying information, or if they wanted to, to provide some context for the, for the response, or if they wanted uh, to just uh, to say thank you. Um, yeah? Was this a push or a pull kind of operation? Push. Push. This one is push. So you call them back. You call them back. And so if, if they miss the call, then they get back. Right? It's either they got a missed call from the system, and they call back, and they do what they retrieve it. Right? Um, and then finally, they could bookmark this. If they wanted to store this for later reference, they could just bookmark it until they could review it later by calling the system. Finally, the last component is that if there was an answer or a message that was relevant to a large network of potential farmers, like let's say there's a, a new pest in the region, or the weather is going to change, or something like that, then it could be broadcast to all farmers that grew a particular crop or lived in a particular region. And how did the system know this? Well, it knew this by based on what questions each person had asked before. And so they could send this notification out to everyone who had asked a question, for example, about cotton. And so in this way, this, uh, this question and answer way, you know, we build up these essentially the equivalent of message threads, but using voice, you know, this kind of asynchronous back and forth between farmers, between experts, and including peers as well. <coughs> um, so, you know, we've run this system continuously in Gujarat and in India for, for over four years now. And so that long experience has allowed us to, to run a number of experiments using uh, this deployment essentially as a test bed. And so the first experiment we ran was just to, to, to kind of uh, show the feasibility of this kind of approach. And so we ran a pilot evaluation with about 65 farmers with all of these functions and features. 
And that evaluation showed that the system was first and foremost useful. The farmers were using it quite frequently. They were gaining a lot of value from it, at least anecdotally. And also, we were able to observe and document some of the same kinds of social dynamics that we see on the internet. You know, this idea of there being a power distribution of users. And also, one, one very popular uh, practice was just lurking on the message boards, just listening to the questions and answers that were going on as a form of entertainment. And so we had examples where farmers, where they had to go out into the field at night and water the fields, they would just call up the system, put their headphones in, and just listen, listen, listen to kinds of things people were discussing. Um, so that was a very uh, a promising start. You know, we also showed that farmers in general, and contrary to what a lot of uh, technologists thought, preferred just simple touch tone input. You know, if they had to choose between one in 10 options, well, they'd rather just press the number than having to guess what word to say to make the speech recognition behave in the correct way. And so that was one thing we documented both experimentally and through continued usage of the system. And then more recently, you know, we've had a couple of additional results, which I'll, which I'll talk more about uh, in the next few slides. And so one experiment we ran was to compare <coughs> how influential information was that came from peers as opposed to experts. And so one of the properties of Vajotlo that we are a wise day that we've had since the beginning is the ability for peers, other farmers, to answer one another's questions. And so what we wanted to assess was that was that was there real value in that kind of approach? You know, were farmers valuing information from peers as much as information that was coming from experts? And so we ran a controlled experiment where we re recorded <coughs> seven agricultural tips, you know, in, uh, information that would be useful for farmers in, in their practice on different topics, and we recorded all of, excuse me, all of this, all of these tips uh, from two different sources, and uh, both uh, agricultural scientists and also from peer farmers. And so the structure of the tip was uh, as such: you, at first, in the first uh, uh, <coughs> line, the source introduced himself. They said either "Hi, I am an agricultural scientist from such and such location," or "Hi, I am a farmer from such and such location." Then they recorded the tip, and the tip content was <coughs> remained constant across both sources. And finally, they provided a phone number where the farmer could call back for additional information uh, about that tip. And that was the behavioral measure, because to call back, they'd actually have to use their own airtime and their own hard-earned money to make that phone call. And so this was, uh, this was, uh, this was what we were uh, looking for. <coughs> so each farmer received a mix of sources, including both farmers and experts. And we, 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 we saw what happened. And surprisingly, we, we found more follow-ups, more people called back on their own dime when the source was a peer as opposed to when they were an expert. And now this was a really interesting finding because in all of our interviews and surveys, farmers consistently said that they preferred information from experts. And so this was a very, very surprising finding. And to be honest, we still don't understand why, why this was the result that we obtained. Um, we have some possible explanations. There should be a slide on those explanations. Um, but some possible explanations include that, you know, that, that there was a bias here. You know, these farmers had had prior experience with the Vajot loans. They were just used to receiving peer content. And so they had become accustomed to, to obtaining that kind of information. And so they were more likely to, to act upon it. Another possible explanation is that there's a solidarity effect that farmers wanted to, to express their solidarity with other farmers. And so they really were, were calling back because they, they appreciated getting knowledge from, from their peers. Another possible explanation is that there's a novelty effect. You know, when this kind of expert knowledge is distributed, typically it comes from experts, people from universities, people who work for a think tank. And so just getting that content from a farmer was potentially a new thing for them. And so they responded because of that. A final explanation, and you know, personally, what, what I think is the most plausible, although we don't have a lot of evidence for it, is that there's a perceived social desirability of getting information from experts. You know? That because we're experts, you know, we are scientists, we're coming from the United States, from these prestigious universities, when we talk to farmers, obviously they told us, yes, we'd like to get information from experts, because that's perceived to be the right answer. And, and when they were able to do what they wanted, and when they, when they thought that their choices wouldn't be visible to us, they actually did what they preferred, which was getting information from, from peers. And, 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 and so we have some a little bit of evidence for that, because when we tried another measure, which was uh, we had farmers wait on hold. To, uh, so after the call, that they were told that you can, you can hold on and you'll be able to talk to an expert or to this farmer. And we measured how long they waited on hold. You know, we just made them wait for minutes and minutes. You know, a little bit mean, but you know, that's what we did. <laughs> and they, in fact, waited longer to talk to an expert than they would have waited to talk to a peer. And so that says, again, that maybe if they perceived that their decision would be visible, 
they were making, quote unquote, the right choice as opposed to what they preferred. But again, we don't have evidence to, for ruling out any of these potential hypotheses. Yeah? Knit were these communities. So, would a farmer that got called know the farmer that was providing the answer, or the expert, or so on? No, they didn't have any prior knowledge of any of the sources. That's a good question. Yeah, they didn't know where they're from, right? But they didn't know who the individual was. Yeah, we controlled for that. So, this this was one finding we we we, we found, and, and it's worth some follow-on work to see what's really going on here. So, another thing that we've been doing in collaboration with some uh, economists from Harvard is that we're conducting a randomized control trial uh, I I assessing the impact of this system on farmer productivity, decision making, uh, adoption, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're running a randomized control trial with 1,200 farmers where some fraction is actually being provided access to this service and some fraction is not. And so what we're finding so far is that of the treated farmers, those are provided access to this service, a significant fraction are using the system, uh, almost 60%. Out of that 60%, a majority of that of those farmers have already asked a question in terms of participating in the system. And of that 40% or 32% who've asked a question, 16% have answered a question, they answered another farmer's question, right? Yeah? Isn't that one of the first venues where people studied information diffusion? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how much this word of mouth might be polluting a condition like that. It's a great question. And, and that, so this is a, a trial that's uh, we've got our mid, mid, midterm survey that's done. The final survey is not done. And that final survey is going to actually look into those word of mouth kinds of questions. Where people using the system would be more likely to then spread the, the knowledge wider. Absolutely right. And so what we've done is we reported the names of farmers' friends. We know who their friends are. We know the people who they talk to. And so we can go back and look at whether those farmers perform better, cool. whether treated farmers' friends perform better than, than treated farmers' non-friends. Right? So that's a great question, but something we don't have data for yet. In this particular study, do people have to pay for the phone call? No, they don't. That's a great question. Yeah. Farmers do not have to pay for the phone calls. We work on what's called a missed call basis, and so they make a missed call to the system, and they immediately get a call, which is on our dime. Right? But it'd be great to see willingness to pay also, which we're not assessing in this particular study. Um, <clears throat> so what are our findings so far? So one thing is that you know, even on this larger scale, with the caveat that Scott mentioned, that farmers still aren't paying to participate, we are still seeing some of the same rich social dynamics that we saw initially in our much smaller and more limited uh, initial uh, experiment. So yeah, those, 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 those findings do have some durability. Also, we're seeing that there's a significant impact on farmer decision making. And so early on through the system, farmers were recommended to use a pesticide that was more effective for the pests that typically plague BT cotton, which is a genetically modified form of cotton. And this is against, you know, usually farmers just use a traditional pesticide, which is not effective against those same pests. And we find that the farmers that have been treated with the service are significantly more likely to use that more effective, which is also a more environmentally and personally health friendly kind of pesticide, are, are more likely to use uh, the, the alternative that's, that's been disseminated through the system. We also find that for the farmers that have been treated through the system, through interviews and through surveys, they, that they almost always cite this service now is their primary source of agricultural information, uh, as opposed to input suppliers, you know, the ones that are selling them the, the pesticides and, and, the, and the fertilizers who, who are obviously biased in what they might recommend in terms of what they have on stock and what's most profitable to them, and also farmers from their village who may not be as knowledgeable as the sources uh, that, are, that are represented on this system. So a lot of <coughs> evidence for, 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 for the impact of the system, at least at the midway point. Um, we, we still aren't to the point of actually assessing the impact on productivity and income, which we will be doing at a later phase. Um, <clears throat> still, there are some limitations in the study, some things that we're finding that, that are still uh, 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 <coughs> problems that we need to address. So first of all, not everyone has used the service. You know, even though it's free, 40% haven't used it. Why? We don't know. Um, the people that are using it, we're finding, are more educated than the ones that aren't. Right? That's also a surprising finding, especially since we've done so much work on making the system accessible to all kinds of groups. And so there is still some kind of digital divide here. It may not be a UI issue anymore. It may be, it may be related to other issues that are more social or more related to personal psychology. We just don't know. But it's still a digital divide, even in terms of using this kind of service. Um, <clears throat> that said, you know, the, the decision making is not affected by education. We're finding farmers that have get, gotten uh, the information, they're, they're choosing to, to take up the advice regardless of education, but we are finding that they're not understanding why they're doing what they're doing. And so 
we, we, in the messaging to farmers, we tell them not only which pesticide to use, but why they should be using it. And they use the right pesticide, but they don't know why still. And that's also more true for, for less educated than more educated farmers. And so still some limitations, um, but, but I think these are interesting questions for, for further inquiry. Um, <clears throat> getting a lot of positive feedback about the system. You know, so we regularly get congratulatory phone messages that just say how valuable the information is that they're receiving through the system. You know, in this case, not only do we get some uh, thanks, but immediately the farmer asks a question, which shows, again, the, the value of the information that the service is providing. Um, and some things we get that we just can't describe at all. So this is just, you know, a traditional folk song. And the interesting thing is that this guy re recorded six renditions of this song, right? And so just as weird as the internet, right? You know, so, <laughs> so that, that shows, you know, weird people are using this service and doing weird things on it, which is one thing I love about it, you know? And, and so uh, 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 I hope to continue to see this kind of phenomenon. So uh, as some of you probably know, you know, uh, after, after a number of years of running this service, we decided to launch a startup, uh, Neil and, I, my, and myself, that essentially provided this as a hosted service. You know, initially we just did this because no one else was going to do it. We needed someone who was going to host the computer, host the line, take care of the technology, and if no one else was going to do it, we had to do it. And so uh, you know, through that process, we found that agriculture was not the only use case. We're finding other organizations that are coming to us in the area of education, in, in the area, area of health, in the area of uh, labor transparency, uh, that also need this kind of voice, hosted voice service. And so we're now working with a number of these groups to, to essentially provide them this platform across the entire country of India, in fact. Um, one of them, in fact, is a Stanford group. Uh, Stanford group is using the service to essentially monitor the distribution of, of, uh, of subsidies to, uh, to, to, to villagers in, in Bihar. And so uh, continuing a long tradition of Stanford using Berkeley software. <laughs> uh, so revisiting this outline, you know, I talked about Awaz Day, which talks about this uh, idea of making user interfaces more accessible to, uh, to underrepresented groups. Um, the next part I'm going to talk about is local ground. And so local ground is really about making the process of data management and data processing more accessible. And in this case, not to farmers in India, but to youth in the East Bay. And so how can we make the process of data management, data processing, data analysis, visualization, more accessible uh, to the communities that we work with there, who are primarily high school youth. Um, and finally, the last question that Local Ground is asking, which I'll revisit towards the end of the talk, is that can these kinds of new forms and processes of knowledge representation uh, uh, actually have an impact on political representation? Can we make a difference in how the world works? And I, I, I'm not sure I really have an answer to that question yet, but it, it's something that I do want to pose. Um, <coughs> So before I start, I want to visit this idea of meta-representation. So, you know, Awaz Day is very successful in terms of collecting this kind of unstructured knowledge from communities, you know, oral knowledge, knowledge that's situated in specific contexts. But if we want to aggregate this knowledge, if we want to make some kind of aggregate decision, if we want to analyze this data, this knowledge has to be processed. It has to be, and processed often means converting that knowledge into some kind of categorical, structured, or, quant or quantifiable form. And so how does that process work? And so this is related to an idea called meta-representation uh, proposed by DeSessa and others that, that says that actually this is a very nuanced and, 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 and important literacy to have. You know, this ability to, to convert knowledge between different representations and to be able to choose the best representation for any given task or situation is actually a key literacy. It's, it's, it shows deep learning of the underlying concepts that that knowledge embodies. And so can we build this, uh, this kind of literacy around meta-representation uh, around empirical phenomena and data? It's really the question that we're asking here. And so we thought we'd start with a representation that's, in some sense, very, very familiar, a map. You know, a map essentially indexes knowledge by place. It, it ties knowledge to specific locations geographically. And so this project, Local Ground, is essentially a tool that allows youth and other communities to collect visualize, analyze, and present spatial data. <coughs> so this is joint work with my former master student and current PhD student, Sarah Van Wert. Her dog was not involved, although it did provide moral support. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and also a number of youth and community groups across the East Bay, uh, 
uh, that we've been working with, including uh, the Lawrence Hall of Science, the uh, Center for Cities and Schools at UC Berkeley, uh, ISEED, and, uh, and the Oakland Unified School District, although uh, they're on the slide. <coughs> Uh, and so, you know, here's the general process we're trying to support, you know, this process of scientific inquiry, you know, based on empirical data. And so this process starts by posing research questions, asking research questions, right? You know, and then the important part of it is actually choosing the right question. How do you decide what the right question to ask is, right? And so once you've done that, you have to actually construct measures that help you answer that question, collect data that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, that is relevant for those measures and structure that data. And finally, analyze that data to, to either uh, refine your hypotheses, verify them, or to make new kinds of inferences. And so this is the process of inquiry that we're trying to support. And for us, the first uh, step is observation. Just taking stock of your environment, seeing what's going on, what's there, what's relevant, what are the questions worth asking. And so I'm going to start this by talking about one use case, which is planning a park. And, and this was in uh, Richmond, which is a, a a city just north of Berkeley, uh, which has <coughs> numerous issues, which I won't go into here. But this particular project was about involving youth in the planning of this park as part of a larger process of civic engagement with the community. And so the first step for us was just asking youth what was going in that park now? What, how was that space being used? What was around that park? What were the relevant things in the environment or in the community that people who were planning this park should be aware of, right? And so they did this in relatively low-tech ways. The first and most <coughs> effective low-tech way was just drawing on a paper map. And so the first thing that Local Ground allows you to do is to print out a paper map and just draw on it to take notes about what's going on in that space. And so here you see some examples. You know, here I guess is a, this is a map of Kennedy High School. I guess here's where the troublemakers hang out. You know, uh, <coughs> this is where they play kickball, swimming pool. It's really loud over here. So lots of kinds of observations about that space and, and how it was being used. And so this brings up kind of the first tension or decision in this kind of process is that we don't start with measurement. We start with observation. We just start with taking stock. And this leads to kind of open-ended kinds of, 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 of findings that can't be neatly tied down to any specific kind of indicator or data collection instrument, right? And so we found lots of things that we may not have expected to find when we started this project. You know, so for example, we found that the Nystrom Village Community Center, in parentheses, is not very welcoming. It's just not a, not a good place. You know? and, and someone else said it looks like a crack house, in fact. You know? <laughs> and so you know, you know, th these are the kinds of things we were finding. You know, this, this area has low fencing. You know? it's, a, it's a robbery type area. You know, would you have created an indicator for a robbery type area? You know, probably not. You know? And so these are the kinds of findings that are just surfaced by this kind of open-ended data collection strategy that allows you to just draw, take notes, write in the margins, you know, do things that would not be possible with a structured form. Um, <clears throat> so once you've collected this data on paper, you can take a picture of it or you can scan it. And using some very simple computer vision, we're able to extract all the annotations and put them on a Google map. And this is actually a very powerful process. You know, once the students saw that what they drew could be digitized in this way and hosted on the internet, all of a sudden their data was on Google. And that's how they referred to it. Our data is on Google, right? And that gave their data, their voice, a credibility that it didn't have before, right? And it was a very interesting thing. And it continues to be, you know, people don't call the system local ground. They call putting it, their data on Google. You know, that's literally what they refer to it as, right? And so just that process of digitization confers so much legitimacy on community data. So they were able to collect all of these kinds of hand-drawn annotations, and they were also able to add other kinds of data, in this case, a picture. So here's a picture of a methadone clinic, which happens to be across the street from the park, and happens to be across the street from where the planners had decided to put the slide and, and the swings, right? And so the youth were like immediately like, you can't put the slide and the swings there. There's a methadone clinic. There's all these guys passed out right in the street in front of there. And so it just shows that, again, all these different kinds of data can have a dramatic impact on what's actually done at the level of decision making. Um, so once the data has been digitized, we can kind of interpret and analyze it, right? And so here you see a lot of drawings of cupcakes. What do you guys think that those cupcakes mean? We didn't know either. We had no idea what those cupcakes meant. And so we had to go back and ask students what those cupcakes meant. 
And so when we went back and did that, someone's like, oh, cupcakes, man. That means making out, you know, cupcaking. Cupcaking is making out. And so they refer to making out as cupcaking, right? And so this shows us that while the initial data was ambiguous, you know, it was completely ambiguous to us what that data meant, it became precise through this social process of interpreting the data. And so what this illustrates is that precision is not inherent in the, in the data itself. Precision can also often arise as a, pro, a social process of interpreting data and placing it in context, right? And so this shows that you know, precision is not something we can always expect uh, to, to be there at the starting point. <coughs> so here you see Cupcaking Spot. And she's actually created a legend. If we had looked closely, we would have seen that there's a legend here where she's put hearts here. And all the Cupcaking Spots are labeled with hearts, right? And so there's, in fact, some evidence you know, we could have figured this out if we tried hard enough. So this next step, once you have a sense of what the important questions are, what the right indicators are, Cupcaking, whatever it might be, then you actually go and collect data that can help you answer the questions you're interested in, right? And so for this, I'm going to talk about another use case and another project that we did in Oakland, in East Oakland, with Castlemont High School and Oakland Unified School District, where we were looking at food access, uh, and in particular, looking at grocery stores, grocery stores that are there in Oakland and in East Oakland in particular. So this data set we downloaded from the State of California Department of Corporations. You know, all these purple dots refer to grocery stores in Oakland. So when we show this map to youth at Castlemont, they're like, hell no. There are not that many grocery stores where we live. There's just no way there are that many grocery stores, right? And so what they did is they designed this data collection instrument that allowed them to go and visit each of those stores, point out on the map where it was, and then collect some structured data about each of those locations. And so they noted down the name of the store, a qualitative rating about how, 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 how good the food was there, categorize the store, and also some open-ended notes, right? So once they collected this data, again, using relatively simple computer vision techniques, we were able to extract all the annotations, extract all of their notes, and provide an interface for them to digitize this data on their own as a group in the class, right? And so they took each of these observations and they just digitized them one by one, right? And, you know, amazingly, this is data entry. It's boring. It's lame. But the students loved it. It was super fun because they were doing it together. It was allowing them to interact with technology in a way they hadn't done before. They were actually creating and managing data. As they digitized a row, it showed up on the map. And they again, the data was on Google, right? So the data they had just written down on paper was all of a sudden on Google, visualized, just like the Department of Corporations data, right? And so this shows another tension between automation and participation. You know, as a computer scientist, I might have said, well, we'll just collect that data using tablets. Or I'll use OCR to digitize all that data. That would clearly be more efficient. But that wouldn't give students the kind of visceral feeling and understanding of what it meant to participate in that process of creating that data with their own hands, through their own labor, right? Giving them a sense of the provenance of that data. Where did it come from? How, did, how was it created? How did it become digital? How did it come to arrive in a form that could manipulate that data, right? And so this shows like, that there's a trade-off here between how much we automate versus how much we give people an opportunity to participate in that process. Uh, yeah? Do you, a sense, I mean, do you have a sense of when you want to automate and when you want to not? Because I think all of us have had experiences where looping more people in has exactly the buy-in experience that you're talking about. On the other hand, we could get rid of, we could throw all the computers in the world out the window. Uh, and that's probably not where we want to head. So how, if, if from a designer's rule of thumb, how do you decide when to automate and when to humanize? Okay, that's a great question. So, uh, so I don't have a general rule, but I have a rule for our particular goal. And our goal is learning. You know, our goal was giving students the process of learning what data is. Where does data come from? How does data become data? How does one use data? And if one's goal is learning about data, then I don't think automation is the right answer. You know, I don't know if there's a general rule, but at least in this instance, you know, participation trumped automation. Um, and you know, it'd be an interesting empirical question to ask, actually, to compare these different interfaces where one, in one situation it was done automatically, and in another situation it was done manually, and whether or not our goal of learning was actually fulfilled. And that's an experiment we'd like to run. Also, you could also view it as time is a scarce resource. And a different way to go is that, well, we automate this part, but we let you do this other part, like more exports or data or something like that. So that's what you spend class time with. Right, right. And that, I mean, it, 
that'd be an interesting question to ask again empirically, right? You know, it, where is your time best spent? And so all I can say now is my intuition, right? And so my intuition is that this was the most fun the students had during that whole summer, was actually digitizing their data. So strictly on a fun metric, right, they had a great time. And I think fun is an important part of learning, right? And so anecdotally, I can say this is an important way to use our time. Uh, um, so once they've uh, digitized that data, also georeferencing it by dragging the marker to where that ob observation actually occurred, again, on the map, again, giving them a sense of where that data came from. Yeah? In that, digitiz in that digitization process, was there also elaboration and reinterpretation of the data? Did they, like, cross-check or comment? Was the data changed from what you would have gotten from optical scanning? Great question, and absolutely that occurred. You know, there, there were process of, you know, it helped the process of categorization. Some groups might have used slightly different terms to refer to the same thing, and they were able to converge on a, a standard set of categories through that process, right? They were able to discuss you know, some people visited the same place, and so they were able to discuss their findings socially as a group while they were digitizing that data. So that's a great benefit that I didn't, that I didn't mention, is actually that process of digitization gave opportunities for interpretation and reflection and social sense making also. Yeah, great point. Um, <clears throat> so now you see, you know, these were supposedly all the grocery stores in Oakland and in East Oakland. And we find out that, in fact, no, all of them were not grocery stores, right? Some of them were convenience stores. Some of them were liquor stores. Some of them were specialty stores. And some of them, we still don't know what they are, but they're clearly not grocery stores, right? And so, again, this showed that youth can have a voice. They can have a voice on saying, is this data actually true? Do we believe this data? What's our perspective on this same phenomenon, right? So I'm wondering, do you think would they have a voice in the sense that if we, if we just put this out there and said, you could use this if you wanted, and it wasn't something that was part of a course, do you get the sense of what it would take to get them over the hump to start? Uh, I, I wouldn't hold my breath. <laughs> so so what is it that, was it once they bought in, there was like some cost fallacy, and they're like, yeah, actually, this is worthwhile? Well, I mean, this was light years, more fun, more engaging, more fulfilling than what they typically do in the classroom, right? And so that was a low bar to get over. Would they rather do this than playing video games or listening to music or watching TV? That's probably a lot less likely. So you view this largely as a way to get citizen engagement and scientific method, in a sense, That's right. into the classroom. That's absolutely right. Or like educational mm -hmm. right? And, and our work right now, which I'll, I'll talk about at the end, is mostly working through school programs, school districts, with teachers, right? This is educational software. It's not fun software. Well, yeah. The yeah. Feels like theory. A little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was really intrigued by your earlier remarks drawing on DeSessa, et cetera, on the meta representation. It seems like part of this is to provide the scaffolding for the students. You actually make a lot of representational decisions on their behalf. So I don't know, hope I'm not cutting to oh, yeah. but I want to hear more about how the students get involved in choosing the representation. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We will get to that. I got some time. <laughs> Um, so you can see not all of them are grocery stores, and you can also see, you know, how they are perceived in terms of quality, right? And so again, getting back to this issue of representation, this is not the only representation that the students use to understand this phenomenon, right? They also just took pictures of the stores, made slideshows, conducted audio interviews, right? And so this shows, you know, in terms of representation, how we can combine qualitative and quantitative data to give us deeper and more nuanced understandings of this kind of phenomenon, right? And so just, you know, not through my voice, through the student's voice, we'll look at some pictures and interviews that they conducted themselves. How was it when you went inside? It was dirty when I went inside, and I would never eat anything in there. Do you consider this to be a grocery store? Hell no. Why? <laughs> because it's, they don't sell any groceries, and it's just a bunch of junk food in there. We just came out of like a supermarket. It was called Gazali's and it was, I liked it. I felt like everything was organized and it was nice and I saw like the workers fixing everything that were like out of place. They sell alcohol and stuff but it's not like a hell of alcohol. It's like, you know, they have their one little section as if you were in a regular store. They don't sell single beers. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, buy a whole pack. So again, you know, qualitative data that reinforces the quantitative findings. And this creates so much more richness in the observations and how we understand those observations than just seeing dots on a map. So the next step 
is to visualize data. And you know, I know there's a lot of experts in this in the room, so I won't overstep my bounds. Um, but you know, we're going to talk about you know different ways that this kind of data can be visualized, right? And so for this, I'm going to talk about a third project, which is around visualizing air quality around the BART system. And so for this project, we were working with the Lawrence Hall of Science eBay's program, which is a summer program of scientific inquiry for uh, for youth. And so youth took these particulate matter sensors and they rode a whole BART system basically. And so here's the kind of data they collected across BART. You know, these air quality readings range from green to red. And you can see that there are some situations where there's just not good air quality, right? And so why? You know, why, why, is that, why is that the case? And so another important thing is to be able to understand data in context, right? And so we were able to overlay these quantitative readings on street view to understand where that data came from. What is the source of that data? What's going on there? What's the situation? What's in the environment? How is it being used, right? In addition to the pictures and the audio and all of that, right? And so this shows the Coliseum and the air quality walking down the street uh, that the students collected, right? And so this shows that we have to be able to understand data in context, not devoid of context, right? With context. Where does it come from? What is the environmental uh, uh, context of where, where that data comes from? So the major impediment to air quality is the back end of the bus. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. Let the students say this. Let the students, the students will do a much better job of it than I will. Uh, so the fourth step is exactly this. How do we interpret this data? You know, how do we make sense of it? How do we use it to create new hypotheses, refine our old ones, right? And so that's exactly what, what the students are going to tell you. We read an article on a similar thing, which is the subway in Paris, which they, they claim that the reason that they're particular matter levels were so high is because the brakes and like the wheels sprang on the tracks. So we think that that might be happening in Barcadero and the underground stations. This is the picture we took at Barcadero. All this black stuff is like this and dirty. It's pretty bad. The reason why it was so high was because the friction from the brakes from the um, train of it stopped so much with collected the PM to make it so high it doesn't have no room to escape. The well, Pittsburgh Bar Station had lower PM concentration than we thought it was because of the cars on the freeway. Like it's an outdoor bar station. So we think all the cars on the freeway, instead of them being stuck in traffic, they're moving and all the wind that is caused by it, it just takes all like the dust with it. And most of the bad PM. Pittsburgh, the reason why it was so low is because Pittsburgh is right next to the water. So the water helps to maneuver the, um, the PM to go to different places. So all of these recordings and visualizations here, they actually come from presentations that the students made to the community and to the BART public relations people, right? And so the students were actively involved in choosing the representations that they would use to make specific empirical points. And you can see this process of interpretation that really leverages all of these kinds of different representations that students were creating and, and, and aggregating. And, and it shows also how that process of interpretation can lead to both the verification of hypotheses. You know, in the case of Embarcadero, they had read a paper that underground bar, uh, train stations have less air quality, and they were able to collect data, both qualitative and quantitative, to verify that hypotheses, and also refine hypotheses, right? So initially they thought that the Pittsburgh station, because it was on the highway, would have poor air quality because of all the cars that were passing there, right? But they actually collected data, they went there, they saw what was going on, and they found that was not the case. So finally, you know, they've been through this process of, uh, uh, of scientific inquiry through data and the last step is to present the results and hopefully present the results in a way that they can have an impact, right? And here I revisit the last question, which is, can these new forms and processes of knowledge representation actually have an impact on politics? And so for this, we revisit Richmond. And so Richmond, uh, as you'll remember, students were involved in, re, uh, re, uh, in, in, in planning a local park. And what they decided what they'd really like to see in that park is a graffiti wall. They were really psyched about it, right? And so this shows a 3D model that they constructed and again took a picture of and overlaid on the map to show how they would like that park to evolve. And so you can see a graffiti wall, you can see a running track, you can see some paths, a garden. And so they took all of these different visualizations 
And they made their case at a town hall meeting where lots of community groups were presenting their ideas about how that park should be designed and used. And there's the Nisha Village, and then there's a liquor store opportunity, there's a, um, a busy street. And so if you had like a snack girl in the community, it would prevent you know, people from walking across the street where it's unsafe. Uh, right here, right here. Right here. I think it looks better stacked up because it shows everybody and it shows like more business I like that though. I mean, it really gives you a sense of the complexity of the place. It's multi layered and there's all kinds of different things that you have to take into consideration. So that's not an actor. That's actually a guy that works for the Richmond Town office, right? He's wearing the suit on purpose, he's official. Right? So he understands where the youth are coming from. He understands how they're collecting this data and how they're using it to make their point. Right? But after this whole process, after this, we thought the students did a great job presenting their ideas, their perspective, advocating for them. At the end, town managers like, no graffiti wall. There is not going to be a graffiti wall in this park. Right? Because that's just not the way he thought that the city of Richmond should be represented and how the park should be laid out. And so that was tremendously disappointing to us, for the students, for everyone involved with that process. And this just shows that data is only a part of the political process. Right? It's only part of it. You know, politics trumps all at a certain level. And so we're still grappling with this. You know, we're still grappling with, with this whole you know, process and how students can have an impact in their communities through science, through data, while dealing with the political realities that exist at that point. Yeah. Because it's very local data like that. Did you have them go out and get statistics on where other places had data, had graffiti walls, and how kind of <coughs> problems they had, and sort of data in that larger world sense? I think I, I don't think in this case we did that, but I think those would be great things to do, right? And I think I think they can have leverage. Students can have leverage through this kind of process if they collect the right kind of data, if they refer to it in the right way, and that's at least the hope, right? And and so our strategy right now is two pronged. You know, one prong is that. We want students to have a voice. We want youth to have a voice. We want them to be able to advocate for the things they want. But if that doesn't work out, we want them to learn something through that process. We want them to learn skills having to do with data, having to do with analysis, having to do with advocacy and presentation that they can leverage for the next battle. Right? And so this is, this is the, the two-pronged approach that we have. And you can see, you know, and, and the students believe the same thing. They realize the realities. You know, I'm going to talk, show a video in the next slide about uh, about the air quality situation and how students thought what they were doing, what role it could play in making things different. You cannot make a change if you don't know there's a problem. So therefore you have to recognize it and allow others to acknowledge it. So therefore the process of coming up with a solution can be even possible. You know, a lot of people in California have asthma mm -hmm. and this really bad thing can kill you. So that's our whole point of doing this research because we we want to inform the people who have, who, who have asthma um, and to let them know exactly what they're breathing in and try to help them fix it by talking to the BART station. You can actually tell if they if they listen to what you were saying and if the if, and if it decreased, you could under, you would know that they changed something about the BART system. But if it increased, that means you have to keep bugging them until they change it. <laughs> so it shows, you know, the students realize that this is an ongoing process, right? They have to continually be engaged. They have to continually be advocating for the things that they are right. And data is just a tool, one of the tools that they have in that process, right? And it requires this process of continually monitoring, continually analyzing, continually interpreting, and making your case to the powers that be. Um, so one of the challenges we face is how do we get continuity? You know, students are in school for a limited number of years, right? Then they graduate and they're out in the big bad world, right? How are we going to create some continuity around this work in a way that it can really make a difference? I don't have an answer, but I think that's something we're very concerned about. Um, so finally, you know, I'm going to revisit all of these kinds of tensions that I laid out because I think we're asking a deeper question here. We're asking a deeper question about what data is. What is data? Where does it come from? How does it become data? How is it used? How can it make a difference? Right? And we're asking these questions at the same time as the youth are, because I don't really know the answer either. And I think of local ground as essentially being a probe to ask these kinds of questions of what data is. What is it? You know, what's the difference between an observation and a measurement? How does precision arise in data? How can we use qualitative and quantitative 
data in different ways. The question Scott asked, when is it right to automate? When is it right to increase participation? Right? These are all, I think, very important questions about data that we don't have answers for. And we think of the tool that we've built and the processes that we're facilitating as ways of at least giving us more insight into these kinds of questions. We have lots of things we're interested in doing. You know, uh, uh, Sarah is just a first year PhD student, so we have many, many more years to work on these kinds of things. And so we're, we're interested in thinking about how this kind of tool can improve data literacy at the K through 12 level. We're working on partnerships with school districts, with teachers, with community programs to answer these kinds of questions. That means assessing impact, impact on learning, impact on civic agency, impact on career. Um, we're also interested in, you know, how do we combine data into influential narratives? How can we create narratives that combine, again, multiple representations of data to make a point? And how can those narratives be, uh, one, easy to author, and two, convincing? These are the kinds of questions we're interested in there. There's, you know, we think there's more applications of this kind of platform that go beyond youth, go beyond education. You know, for example, community planning in the developing world or even in the developed world. Uh, contributing data to online repositories of maps. You know, that's another area that I think has some potential for future work. Um, dealing with situ areas that are blank spaces on the map. You know, how do we populate those? You know, after a disaster, things are dramatically altered in terms of infrastructure. Can we document some of that? And so to be able to facilitate answering some of those questions, which we won't answer all of them, you know, we're going to be releasing a public beta of this system this summer where anyone who wants to use it can. We've already got 50 users uh, using it for all kinds of weird stuff. Um, so just as a summary uh, of local ground, so first, you know, why paper? You know, paper kept things loose, you know. It wasn't about looking at a phone and pressing buttons, you know. It was about drawing. It was about remaining present, you know, having the attention in the right place, right? And other people have made this point in the past, but we saw it. We saw it firsthand. You know, a lot of the groups we were working with were previously using PDAs or mobile phones, and all they could talk about was how much trouble they had with the technology, and that all went away. It all went away, and it just became about the process. Um, and it also facilitated this combination of accessibility and expressivity. Everyone could contribute data, and they could contribute whatever kind of data they wanted. Drawings, notes, cupcakes, annotations, things in the margin, right? <coughs> Another thing we found, you know, is that both teachers and students really like this combination of science and advocacy, advocacy for your community. It gave science meaning. It gave the reason to do science, right? Because it can make your, your place a better place. Um, you know, I mentioned this about how digitization can increase the credibility of data. And finally, I talked a little bit about how data is just a part of the political process. So finally, just revisiting the outline, you know, I talked about OWAS Day, which is about rethinking user interfaces for making content authoring more accessible to underrepresented groups. And then I talked about local ground, which is to think about rethinking the data pipeline for supporting these goals of learning and access and advocacy. And finally, you know, this big open question that I still have is whether these kinds of new forms and processes of knowledge representation can actually have an impact on politics. And I think that's a big question and one I look forward to spending the next decade on. Thanks very much. URLs, you know, I teach a social entrepreneurship class. A lot of the products that came out of that class are kind of in the crowdsourcing space. And so if you're interested in that, we can talk about it offline and, and any questions. Yeah. One of, the, one of the challenges is to measure students' learning, right? Without measuring that learning, it's hard to understand how those variables, whether you use paper or not, affect the learning. Have you done that in this project? Not yet. We haven't done it yet. You know, we're working with experts in that assessment space, and I think it'll include a combination of kind of performance-based assessment and also kind of qualitative work that can surface kind of case studies, anecdotal examples of specific kinds of mechanisms that worked and were found uh, to be engaging. Yeah. But yeah, that's the next phase. You know. yeah, we've just been building the system. We actually, local ground, we haven't really been studying it or publishing it. You know, we've just been building it. Yeah. Uh, so when you were pulling these kinds of things together, and you're, you're thinking about these educational outcomes, is this fundamentally about trying to lower the bar to, to, to make it easier? Or is this something about where you're, where you're creating something that wasn't ever there before? Like, 
Is is this something where you're trying to actually take something that they didn't they weren't aware of and just bring it in front of them? Or you know, could their data not have been on Google before? I think not in the same way, not in the same kinds of data. So I think in the answer to your question, we're doing both, I think. You know, I think we are trying to lower the bar in terms of being able to author this content without necessarily having digital devices or regular access to digital devices, like smartphones, like PDAs, like desktop computers. So a lot of the groups we work with don't have access to those kinds of devices. And so in this kind of model, they can just draw or take pictures if they have access to a camera or they get a camera, access to a camera through their school and they can contribute their data, right? So in that sense, it's lowering the bar. In another sense, it's allowing them to contribute kinds of data and contribute to data processes in a way that they didn't have access to before, right? And so, for example, being able to collect this rich, open-ended qualitative data around drawings, and, and that just wasn't possible before we built the system, right? So if that's the case, then was there any backlash to being on Google? Like you see businesses really sometimes object to being on Yelp because they have no control over what's going on. You might see here, the city of Richmond might say, like, look, all, we have all of these. When you look at Richmond now, you have all of these you know, structured things about how, how crappy our, our infrastructure is or how, how much we didn't listen to our citizens. What, what, is, what is that kind of future going to look like? That's a great question. We don't have an answer to that yet. So all the data that we're collecting right now, it's essentially in private projects that only the teachers and students have access to. They're not publishing this data publicly for anyone to go on the internet and use. You know, we want to do that. We want to make it possible for students to be able to publish this kind of data. But one, you know, we want the students to be in charge of that process. We want them to feel in control of it, both for learning and also for empowerment, right? And so that's where that work on authoring data narratives comes into play, right? We want not only this data to be in raw form, but for them to actually construct narratives that bring this data together to make points that they'd like to make and they think resonate with their perspective. Will the Richmond City be cool with that? I don't know. Probably not. But you, you know, if you have people passed out next to the park on, on your Google Street View, yeah. artifacts of politics, right? Yeah, yeah. And I don't, I don't think everyone will be cool with that, right? You know, I, I think. But just as Google has the right to decide what should be on Google versus what should not be on Google, we want youth to have a voice in deciding what should be on local ground versus not be on local ground, right? Everyone's got a choice in the matter. None of this is, is neutral, right? And so in this case, we want the choice to be with the youth. And will they make different choices than Google will make? Yes. Will they make different choices than the Richmond City will make? Yes. And, I'm, and, and they're up for it, man. You know, if you go and see them present this stuff, they're totally up for it, man. They're, they're ready to take anybody on, and we want to give them tools in that battle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a couple questions. So you had the slide where you had all the different questions about data, so asking deeper questions about data. And what I thought was interesting is one is it's important to know that none of those are new questions. You know, certainly ever since the birth of statistics and scientific measurement, people are asking questions like that. And there's various answers and they depend on context. And what I really like about this project is I think what's more important than answering those questions in any research sense is finding the right types of activities like you're doing here that get people to understand those, the, the nature of those questions in a deep manner. So in some sense, but no, the deep thing is what you accomplish, not the... the oh, I completely side. agree. I thought that was really interesting. So I just wanted to make that comment because I think that's really an exciting development that comes out of this work. I think that's absolutely true. And I, I want to I make sure to make clear that I don't think there are new questions either. Would I see this as a platform, as a probe, as a technological probe for answer, for giving people kind of an intuitive sense of those questions, right? Not that those questions are new, but the probe is new in terms of giving us new light into those questions, right? And then I had some other questions just around the politics angle. So one was, I wasn't totally shocked when the graffiti wall was written off by the city administrator. However, yeah, putting the, the slide for small children across the street from the methadone clinic was interesting. So I was wondering, A, if there were other successes, even if it was a smaller form, which in some ways is more directly tied to observational data. Right. That, that was interesting. And the other is, if you have any thoughts on certainly the, the student's response to the feeling of being heard, even if the action isn't taken, which is often a huge part of participatory planning as well. Right. Yeah. And I actually don't have good answers to these. I think they're good questions I don't have answers to. You know, I don't know where the slide ended up. And two, <laughs> you know, I don't know if the youth, how they felt. And primarily because, I mean, this is a loosey-goosey answer, but 
Sarah was a master student. She just wanted to build the system. She didn't want to research it. I wanted to research it. I've continued to want to research it, and that's why I've got her back as a PhD student, so we can answer these questions that you're raising, which are very good ones, but we just haven't answered yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you talk about putting data on Google and how it legitimizes it. Uh, I wonder if you can say a little more about what legitimization means. Uh, what does it mean, say, for the students? Is it building confidence? Is it helping them ask me questions? Is it giving them new answers? And what does it mean for everybody else, right? So uh, a couple of things that you talked about were the bar station and particulate matter there. And I'm sure there's a lot of scientific literature on how particulate matter behaves inside subjects. So is this sort of legitimizing knowledge opening up the opportunity to look at that literature? Or is it building confidence to a point where you really think that such literature is irrelevant and you can find our own answers? I mean, I think most of it is about, and that's also a great question, I think for the most part it's about an equal playing field. You know, like when the data is on Google and their data can be viewed in the same screen as data that comes from the Department of Corporations, right? They feel like both of that data has the same legitimacy. You know, it's, it's not like their data is just folk data. It's on paper. It's in their classrooms. It's in their, com in their conversations with their peers. It's actually on a platform where it can be overlaid on data that comes from official authoritative sources. Let me, let me finish answering that question first, right? And so, and you also mentioned, you know, what are they contributing yeah. to this process, right? You know, what does it mean for students to say things that others might have said already, right, in terms of the underground stations and stuff? And I think that's just a process of being able to contribute to science. Not necessarily creating new science, but just having the experience of contributing to science. And some of that is just replicating results, going through the process for yourself, and, and having that kind of experience of creating new knowledge, even if it isn't new for the universe, it's new to you, right? And so the second part of your question? So, so what does uh, putting your data on Google at, as, at the same scale as the Department of uh, Corporations get you? What does it get you? Well, I, you know, I, love that I don't know the answer, right? You know, uh, I, I don't know whether what it gets you in a kind of, any kind of material sense. You know, I know what it gets students, again, anecdotally from their own sense of participation, of contribution, of, of self-worth, right? Again, anecdotally, we have some observations that say that was meaningful, but will it change the world? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question yet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious you got to the point where you got, you got them to think about issues of collective responsibility for, for individual choice. I mean, you pick a hypothetical, some student puts a derogatory personal comment on the house of somebody who lives across the street. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's now on Google, it's just as important as, but wait a minute, this is a, you know, the kind of comment you don't want to have on the thing. Do then you get the other students to take responsibility for that and discuss keeping it on, taking it off, that kind of stuff? I think, that, I think those are related to the next set of questions we want to ask, especially when we talk about publishing these results and making them public, right? Right now they're still being used internally for sense making, right? Just for students to decide what's going on. We've never had a discussion with them of actually publishing that data of making it accessible to everybody, right? And I think when we have those kinds of discussions is that these kinds of issues will come up. And I don't know how they'll react to that kind of question because their tone to begin with is just very, I don't know how to say this, but it's just adversarial, you know? They don't want to get along, you know? They don't want to get along with the institutional powers that be. That's not their goal. They want to push back. They feel screwed over and they want to have an opportunity to raise their voice. And so will that always be hunky-dory and will it be smooth? I don't think so, but politics isn't always that way. So when you talk about this kind of collective responsibility, you know, I think there is a kind of collective feeling within that community, but whether that collective responsibility is aligned with the kind of greater civic sense that we would like to see or whether the government would like to see, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. wonder if you thought at all about tools that help, <coughs> help represent or articulate the arguments or counter arguments that your data is addressing. So what are the concerns of the policy makers about this park? Uh, what is it that they care about? Uh, what, are the, what are the beliefs that need to be countered of getting <coughs> what you want to be the end point of your narrative of, of the therefore that provides counter argument to whatever it is that means 
the person you're trying to persuade isn't yet persuaded of what you're trying to convince them. Okay. So that's more sort of rhetoric kinds of support, I would guess. Yeah. I'm wondering if you've thought anything about that space or how the sort of data side, what's the world like side, connects to the what should the world be like side in terms of persuasion or policy change? Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I haven't thought much about that question, to be honest. You know, this is kind of the first volley, as it were. You know, it's the first volley in that rhetoric, right? So this starts a conversation. I don't know how it supports the continuity of that conversation. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this, this allows students to at least participate in the beginning of a conversation. I don't know how that whole conversation plays out. And I think a lot of that conversation probably happens offline. And I don't think it's going to happen through the tool. I think it's going to happen in the real world and through public venues and community meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And what our hope is, is not that this tool embodies that process, but it provides some, some tools to support a particular perspective within that process. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So out of curiosity, what were some of the, I guess, hypotheses going into the local ground project? Because I, I would imagine that if I was starting a project like that, you, know, you would maybe envision it to be a great success or a huge dud. Um, so what were some of the hypotheses that went into it, and how did it compare um, to the end result? Like, what was maybe a big surprise you got out of it that you weren't really anticipating? And again, it gave kind of a glib answer, but, you know, but um, our hypothesis is always the same. You know, it's like pinky in the brain. You know, we're going to change the world, man. You know, and, and uh, we always fail. <laughs> we try, try again. <laughs> so, that's it. We were surprised we didn't get the graffiti wall. I was, you know, we're ever optimists, you know, uh, and so... Uh, I think that that's the hypothesis. I mean, that's the big hypothesis. There's a bunch of small ones, right, around kind of what role does paper play in this process, and and some emerged through the work. You know, when we found how exciting the data entry was, we could, that created a new set of hypotheses around whether that's a valuable learning experience. But the big hypothesis is is the one that I kind of ended with, and and you know, we, we haven't won yet, but maybe someday. <laughs> yeah. Were you surprised by how engaged the students were versus? Um, Maybe you know, uh, the prediction coming in was that maybe they wouldn't take on for a project like this. Were you surprised how engaged they were? Or were you surprised by some aspects of the project they were more engaged in than you would maybe planned at the beginning? Well, data entry is one example of that. And just being engaged in all. So the summer project where you saw those youth present at the end uh, with the air quality, I was only there on the first day. You know, this is Sarah's work. She was there continuously throughout. And again, I should also say it's the Lawrence Hall of Science and the eBay's program provided a lot of that support and scaffolding. So I was only there on the first day. Kids were totally not into it, man. They were just like hanging out, you know. They were like, a couple of them just left, you know. They just left, and and they everyone was just like, you know, just like whatever, man. And then you saw, <laughs> you know, where they got to. And I I've only seen these videos. I wasn't even present in that room, but I was like shocked because I'd seen those people on the first day, and and they were not into it, man. They were not, you know, they were not participating. And by the end, they were. And that guy that you saw at the end saying you got to know there's a problem when there is a problem, he wasn't even in the class. <laughs> he just halfway through the semester just walked in off the street, you know, West Oakland, right? He's just there. It's in a church, you know, where this is all going on. He just walked in. This sounds fun, you know, and he's in. <laughs> and he's into it, you know, he's doing it. And, you know, that answer he gave was actually in response to a community member. So that was a, a public meeting. They were there presenting the results. Community members were there, and one woman raises her hand and says, This is crazy, man. Do people know this is happening? What are you going to do about this? You know, what's going to happen about this? And first, the students were like, We're just kids, you know, <laughs> we don't know what we're going to do. But then he gave that answer, which I thought was a great one, you know, and answered her question. Yeah. Yeah. Any Sorry to be some blue about some of these answers, but you know, they're big questions. I don't have the answers yet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.